Ibo kwenu. Ibo kwenu. Kwenu. Kwezonu. Welcome to Open Square. This program is reaching you wherever you are in the world, live from the coast city of Enugu. I am Chika Ago. This is the third in a series of regional town halls designed to improve citizens' understanding of the work of the National Assembly while enabling legislators to get a first-hand understanding of what their constituents want from them. Open Square is a Daria media production supported by Channels Television and the MacArthur Foundation and Radio Now 95.3 FM Lagos. We're streaming this town hall live on Radio Now 95.3 FM Lagos, as well as on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash this is Radio Now and on youtube.com forward slash Radio Now Studio. It is time to deepen our democracy by asking the right questions and hopefully getting the right answers. To begin today's conversation, here's a message from the MacArthur Foundation. Very important occasion for the MacArthur Foundation as well as for the area media. We are all committed that services that are provided for the citizens are provided in a way that is effective and efficient. That officials who are elected serve their own constituencies, do so in a way that responds to the needs and the desires of their own communities. I therefore want to uh, encourage the participants, and especially the officials, to see this as an opportunity to convey to their own constituencies the kind of work that they are doing, what are the issues that they are dealing with, what are the challenges that they are facing, and how can they work together with their own constituencies in order to improve the quality of lives of the citizens of those areas. I'm sure that all of us would strive towards ensuring that our own citizens become first-class citizens in the Committee of Nations of Nigeria. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Let's now meet our panel of, our panel of legislators from the South Eastern states here present. It's important to say that the invitation for this program was sent to every single senator and representative from the Southeast. And here in the studio with us today, I will start from my immediate left, Senator Ike Ikuremadu. He is here representing Enugu West Senatorial District. Thank you very much for coming, Senator. A pleasure. We also have here with us in the studio, Senator Uche Ikunife from Anambra Central Senatorial District. Thank you very much for coming. We also have here with us in the studio today, Senator A. Naya Baribe for Abia South Senatorial District. Thank you very much for coming here, Senator. Thank you. Glad and also, here. we're joined by Senator Obina Oba for Ebony Central Senatorial District. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. So, here's how this program will go. I'm going to quickly explain the structure of our program. We'll hear from our constituents to try and find out what they understand about the role of a legislator. What do you think the legislator does for you? How can you best describe the job that he does representing you at the National Assembly? And then the legislators will then try to respond to their understanding of what their jobs are and if there are any corrections, you would make them there. It's also important to note here that we have a remote location in Owere, the capital of Imo State, where we also have some constituents on standby who will be joining this conversation as well. And then from understanding what the role of the legislator is, we will then find out how often they interact with their constituents. How easy or difficult is it for you as a constituent to access your representative at the National Assembly. And if there are any means that can be introduced to enable easier access to them, you can feel free to introduce those ideas here as well. We also understand that every job has its challenges. And so we would ask that you share with us some of the challenges you face on the job and how these things can be addressed. And then we will look at how the legislators' activities 
have addressed your need as their constituents. Wherever you are watching us in the world, you're invited to join this conversation as well. So please send us a text on WhatsApp to the phone number on your screen right now. And throughout the course of this program, we will take your messages here. And so, to set the ball rolling, let's begin with what I like to call understanding the legislature from the citizen's perspective. We will take three questions from here in the hall and three from our remote location in Oweri so that they can be a part of this conversation as well. To make your submission, please use the microphone on either side of the room, state your name and where you're from, and then go ahead to make your submission. Remember to keep it as brief as possible. So, if you understand what the work of a legislator is, I would like you to step up to the mic and make your submission. What do you understand is the job of a lawmaker? From this side, please use the microphone right there at the aisle. And then from the other side, let's use the microphone right there at the aisle. What do you understand is the job of a legislator? I'd like for us to begin with that. Anybody here? Anybody, you can please use the microphone there. What do you understand is the work of a legislator? Let's get your name and where you're from. You will need to move a little closer to the mic, please. Sir, can you, if you have to lift the mic, that's okay. If you have to lift it from the, no, if you have to just take out the microphone, perfectly fine, yes. This, um, can we help? Can we help our constituents with this with an extra mic, please? So we are just going to try and get his understanding of what his job, uh, of what the legislator's job is. All right. If uh, if that's all set, we can we can take your contribution. If it's not, let's go to the other side of the room and get your contribution. If there's anyone from that side of the room, please, I uh, step up to the aisle and submit and make your submission. What do you understand is the job of a legislator? Please come to the aisle and uh, make your submission. Whoever is, whoever is going to, yes, please, use the microphone close to you. OK. We're, we're, having a little, we're having some difficulty with your microphone. If you could please uh, hold on for a minute. Um, if we can also get um, any responses from our remote location in Oweri, that would be great as well. Uh, but let me start with you, Senator Ekwerimadu. You've been in the Senate for quite some time now. Um, how would you very simply describe the job that you do every day as a lawmaker representing your people at the Senate? Well, thank you so much. Um, our jobs are laid out in the Constitution. There are others that uh, you can decipher from practices and then from what's happening in other jurisdictions. Because our um, democracy is still quite uh, nascent, it's young. So we try as much as possible to borrow from different places. But the principal job of the legislature is the, the making of laws under Section 4 of the Constitution, whether at the State Assembly or the National Assembly, is to make laws, which is essentially to make law for the uh, order and good governance of the country. And then it goes further to state which areas you need to make laws, you know, and these are contained in Schedule 2 of the Constitution. So they're all demarcated between the federal government and state government, what's called exclusive list and then concurrent list. But those are matters of detail. The other second thing we do is what we call oversight. And it's also stipulated in sections 88 and 89 of the Constitution. That's where you see parliamentarians doing a public hearing 
invite some money ministers and commissioners to come and answer questions. So those are also contained in uh, the constitution. Of course, uh, we approve uh, treaties. So if there is any uh, treaty between Nigeria and another country, it's expected that it will be um, approved by the National Assembly. And sometimes we approve borrowing, borrowing plan and borrowing itself. So it helps with the debt management of the country. Now, we're also under Section 4, which most people don't understand or don't even know that National Assembly is supposed to approve military operations outside Nigeria. For you to deploy members of armed forces uh, to any operation outside of Nigeria, whether it is living war or whatever, you need the approval of the National but Assembly. also cover the police when they go and place the No, the world is um, the armed forces. Okay. Because the executive can deal with that of the police, but essentially, if you are deploying our soldiers, you need the approval, which for most times they don't. Then uh, we also confirm certain appointments, like appointment of ministers and commissioners. You know, so they need the, the um, approval or confirmation of the legislature. The then, of course, we are also involved in the removal of both the president, the vice president, the governor, or the deputy governor, what we call impeachment process. Because we run a presidential uh, um, system, which is different from the parliamentary system. So if you are running a presidential system, there is always a provision on how you can remove an erring uh, chief executive, either the president or the vice president. So these are uh, part of the things we do. Now, if there is any threat to the country, then we also get involved uh, in what we call a um, 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 set of emergency. So the president can now declare set of emergency. Of course, that needs a confirmation, approval of the uh, parliament. If we are not in session, we have to be reconvened. If we are in session, we have to do it quickly. Okay. Yes. Then finally, there's also what we call uh, parliamentary diplomacy. So that's why we get ourselves involved in uh, international organizations like the IPU, the COAS Parliament, you know, the Commonwealth Conference, International Parliament for Peace and Tolerance. That gives us visibility as a country. You know, so, so it is essentially the summary of what we do as parliamentarians. Um, let me come to you for a minute. No, but let me add okay. also that what we, there's also what we call representation. We borrowed that from America. It's not in the Constitution. That's where we talk about constituency projects. Okay. We go out to see what we can get for your people, in terms of roads, and health facilities, oh, all right. and all of that. All right. So let me come to you for a moment here, Senator Um, What are some of the misconceptions about your job as a lawmaker that you have heard? Um, I, I, I don't think that uh, we can clearly hear what you're saying, so if you could maybe speak up a little louder, Honor Senator. Okay, so why, why, we're going to try and get that fixed here. Um, okay. Can we, you know, we'll try and, we'll try and come to you in justice in, in a minute, um, because, you know, it's for broadcast purposes, so we need to be able to get people up. Um, so we'll come back to you in a, in a, in a minute, Senator. Um, Senator Barry Bay, I, I think maybe you should um, save the day here and, and take the question. What are some of the common misconceptions about your job that you've heard from Nigerians? Well, I think that the basic misconception about the role of a legislator is that uh, the public thinks that the legislator is also an executive. And so the basic misconception is that they assume that a legislator should build roads, should put borehole, should do all those things that the executive is expected to do. That is the fundamental misconception. Uh, like uh, Dr. Kuremadu has said, we borrowed from the American system representation of your people. And representation in this sense means that we can put things in the budget for our constituents. But our basic job is to make laws for the good governance of the people of Nigeria. Um, Senator Ogwa, if I may come to you, what are some of the common misconceptions about your job that you've heard, maybe from your constituents or even from um, other Nigerians? I'm having the same problem. Okay, it does, it, it does appear that, that we might be having some... Uh, problems with, with some microphones there. We sincerely apologize for that. Uh, we'll try and get that sorted in just a moment. But 
uh, remember that this is all about trying to understand what the job of a lawmaker is and help deepen your understanding of the process so that you can better engage your lawmakers. If we have um, our represent, if we have our constituents in Oweri, um, they can join the conversation now. And what do you understand is the job of a legislator representing you at the National Assembly? Um, also, I understand that the microphones in the hall are functioning now, so uh, if you would love to step to the mic, that, that would be welcome as well. What are some of the jobs that you think your lawmakers should be carrying out that, um, in your opinion, they might not be carrying out? And obviously, if, there is any, if there's any misconception here, you know, we would take that. Oweri, let's hear you. What, in your opinion, are the jobs of a, uh, of, of a lawmaker representing you at the National Assembly? Uh, I want you to start by introducing your name and uh, telling us where you're from, your constituency. Okay, my name is Prince Chimeze Okoro. I am from where not LGA, Imo State. Now, um, summarily, the job of our lawmakers has been summarized into two. Um, one is making laws for the good governance of Nigeria. And the second most important one there is um, active, underline that word, active and result based oversight functions. You don't just make laws, tell me you are doing oversight functions. Meanwhile, you are not even close to where those laws are being implemented. As parents, we give our children things to do, ask them to do things, and then we leave. That is not an active and oversight function. So as lawmakers, one of your most important duties constitutionally is not just oversight. It should be, please underline again, active and result-based oversight, which means monitoring and evaluating those laws that you make to see if they are actually being put in place. Thank you. This is my Thank point. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. If, uh, if there's anyone else in the world who would like to make a submission, we will take that submission as well. Um, let, let, Okay, so we do have, we do have another uh, constituent in the on standby. So I remember that you should state your name, state your name and where you're from, your constituency, and then we would have your submission in 30 seconds, please, if you can. I am Marjorie Azinghe from Okibo Nilks Federal Constituency in Imo State. Good morning. Uh, everyone from the southeast, wherever we're joining from, mine is simply this: constituency projects. How, who, what, where, when? Do senators or lawmakers just sit back in Abuja and decide for us what constituency projects to do? Because examples abound of hastily thought up selfish projects that do not have any human face or bring any uh, um, results for the citizenry. Okay. So I, for one, and I think a lot of citizens would like to see constituency projects that meet the needs of the common Nigerian. All right, thank you very Let much. Let the common humanity be the driving force behind thank this Thank you project. very much, thank you. for your contribution. Hello? Uh, that, that was well noted. Um, so let's come back to the studio now, um, Senator Ekunife. Uh, you've heard the submissions from, from yeah. Uwere. Would you like to respond to that? Yes, I would like to start from uh, the contribution from Prince Chimese that talked about the expectations from legislators in terms of active, result-oriented oversight. Section 8.8 has given us, Section 8.8 of the Nigerian Constitution as amended, has given the legislators the power of over, over oversight. 
And what is the reason for oversight? Just checks and balances for the executive. We have three arms of government. We have legislature, executive, and judiciary. Why we make the laws? The executive, of course, implements the laws that we make, while the judiciary interprets the laws. So in making that, we have to oversight the functions of the executive and judiciary. That is active um, oversight. Coming to my sister Marjorie that talked about the constituency project. Constituency project is nowhere in the constitution of Nigeria. It's also not even in our Senate standing rules. It's a creative of National Assembly in order to reach out to our constituents and also to our constituencies. And the Senate, we have certain amount of money allocated to senators or provided for senators in the budget and that of House of Representatives. In the Senate, we have about 250 million, that's the constituency allowance. And how do you deal with that? I have 58 communities, for instance, in my senatorial district. So I have to look at the, through the interactions between me and the constituents to know the areas they would like me to to, or to bring projects to their respective communities. If I decide to put Boho, for instance, I divide that to 50 million to some communities, then some schools, some, of course, road projects and all of that. But if you look at that small allowance, it's quite small to what we do. So we reach out to executives, we reach out to ministers, we reach out to DGs, and even to leaders here, uh, like my brother, Abaribe, that has more allocation than any other senators, you know, reach out to him, to senior president, to speaker, we write them to Toby Okechuku, you know, at least this year he gave me 30 million to Toby Okechuku and all of that. So we reach out to them to see what they can do in order to pacify and meet up with the aspirations and yearnings of our people. So constituency project is just there, but sometimes the ministries don't even implement it fully. So you can have 250 million allocated. At the end of the day, it's just about 120 million that the executive will release. Mm -hmm. And that's the only project that you can... Uh, in, in cases can where do. these bodies are not fully released, what does the legislator do? It depends on the positive of funds. If we have enough funds, of course, if enough funds are not there, they will not. We, don't, it, we have a limit to what we can do to ensure that... The, because also we are appropriate, but then if they don't fund it fully, you keep uh, pushing, of course. There's not much you can do because they don't have the funds. So I, I, I want to talk to you for a minute now, Senator Oba. Um, you have listened to what some of uh, our constituents have said. How would you yeah. respond to their job? Or how would you respond to their description of what yeah. they think your job is? Yes, I listened to what the lady said. She was particularly talking about, you know, the type of project this, the National Assembly people brought to them, even it, it, there's a word she used that is not uh, palatable, but then uh, the whole country, it, the senatorial zones can never be the same. For instance, I myself, when I go to the National Assembly, in fact, I thank those who were in the National Assembly who created this uh, constituency uh, project. Because believe in me, at my age now, the only time my community and so many other ones in my senatorial zone came into the Nigerian budget was when I get to the National Assembly. It is as bad as that. And without that uh, constituency project, there's no single project. You can never find the name bearing that my area in the Nigerian constitution. So you may not, if you now want to, what is good for Senate Kunife's uh, constituents may not be what my own constituent required. I meet with my constituents and they tell me what we do. The most important thing, for instance, we need water, we need road in areas I come from. And these are where, and I'm particularly, I'm in sports, I'm the chairman of the Senate's Committee on Youth and Sports. So we need sports equipment, we need stadium. And these are things where, but you see, as, as you just said, one project alone that people will see, 250 million naira, and so many of our constituents thought that when they had this money, 250 million, they thought they are giving you this money, raw cash. There's need for them to know 
that no no senator or no national assembly are giving cash one naira. This, so if nobody is giving cash, what then is the process of the, it paying is, for the process? No, they that pay direct. Out? It is the ministry that award these contracts. Mm. The ministry also pay the contractors. We don't even nominate contractors. Who identifies the projects to be carried? We out? do that. Okay. We put it in the in the in the project. What you know your 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 constituents required. You try as much as you can, and then you will not allot the money. For instance, if you have 10 projects, you share this money into these 10 projects. It's now left for the ministry to award the contract. And you know, as she rightly said, there's a year that they don't even pay up to 50%, up to 50% of this constituency project. And that is why it's like some of these projects is not completing. So how then do you hold, who then do you hold accountable in cases where the monies released are not complete or that the projects paid for are not completely carried out? The executive. The executive, yes. okay. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. The conversation is only just starting here in the studio. Remember, we're trying to understand what the job of a legislator is. When we return in just a moment, would invite members of the civil society to the mic to hear their submission on what they think the job of the legislator is and how they can bridge, bridge the gap between legislators and their constituents. Stay with us. You're watching Open Square. Welcome back. You're watching Open Square live from the cold city of Enugu. I am Chika Ago here with lawmakers representing constituents from the Southeast. Now, moments ago, we were trying to get an understanding of what the lawmakers do representing us at the National Assembly. We've heard submissions from constituents here in the studio with us. Now we're going to get some responses and questions from our constituents at home. Remember that to be a part of this conversation, all you have to do is text the WhatsApp number displayed on your screen right now. And we do have some questions here. I'd like for us to go over them as quick as possible so that we can move on to other issues. I'll start with you again, uh, Senator Ekweremadu. And the question here is, who, why do you perform oversight for your constituency projects? Because according to this contribution, this contributor here, you can't be the judge and prosecutor in your own case. Okay, um, we're going to need, uh, we're going to come back to you in, in just a moment. And Senator Baribe, if you can, if, if you can uh, respond to that. Check my own. Okay, we can hear you now, Senator. Mine is working. Yes, we can hear you now. Huh? Yes, we can. Please carry on. Okay. Well, the thing is that. Um... This mic is not working. It's not working. No. Oh, Hello? Senator Baribe, I think we can, we can hear you better. Hello? Yes. yes. Um, the. the... The, it's a very intriguing question, saying, why do you have to um, oversight the <clears throat> project that you have? No, we don't do that oversight. The oversight is done by the particular uh, committee of the National Assembly within that particular uh, ministry. For example, if I have put a borehole, in one of my communities, and the National Assembly has to oversight. Those that we go will be the Committee on um, water. water Resources, not myself. Because what have, I have done is to uh, nominate the particular uh, community where that should be done. And I, that will bring me back to what uh, I think Njoku in a way they first said, that we are not doing active oversight. That, uh, that, that's not true. What actually is happening is that according to Section 88, even when we have done our oversight and we have our report, we still have to send the report back to the executive to implement. Mm. That is the issue. And so where the executive is not inclined to do anything about it, then it will not look to the public as if nothing okay. is being 
John. All right. Um, let's move over to members of the civil society, uh, to, to members of civil society here present. Please, I would like for you to talk to us about how you think we can reconcile what the job of a lawmaker is as presently understood by Nigerians and what it actually ought to be. And if you think there is a way in which we can bridge the gap in knowledge, there are microphones on either side of the room. Um, so please feel free to walk up to any of the microphones and con make your contribution. This is particularly for members of the civil society here present. Um, when you are, when you're ready, please step up to the mic and um, we would have you ready. But um, let's now talk to um, our lawmakers again. And this time around, we want to talk about ease of access to your office. And this is important because oftentimes we hear people say that they find it difficult accessing their legislators. So in your case, uh, Senator Ikunife, how would you describe the ease or difficulty with which your constituents can access your office? Well, we don't have a, a particular system of having access to us. It depends on the individual lawmaker. For me, I have a very active um, zonal office in Orca. And um, legislators are located on offices for Senate. We have five staff. The same with the House of Representatives, because I was there before. And um, in having five staff, you are the one that should allocate offices to them. For me, for ease of access, I have more than 20 staff in my zonal office. My office opens from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on daily basis. And in the National Assembly, of course, if you're expecting visitors, you write the names of the visitors and send to the gate for, for access to your own office in terms of inquiries or whatever information they want to get from you. Then on, some people also would like to reach you on phone. I've used my phone for over 20 years now since inception. I don't have two phones. I have one phone and no one answers my call. I answer my call and when I see missed calls, of course, I get back to to the constituent. So it depends on uh, each senator. We don't have um, okay. a, a uniformed way of attending to our okay. constituents. It depends on a particular senator. All right. Um, senator Karamadu, how would you describe the ease or difficulty with which your constituents um, access your office? All right. Thank you so much. Um, this is my 19th year in the Senate. And the one thing I'm known for is that I respond to messages. Now, we all have constituency offices, but my experience is that it doesn't meet the expectations of our constituents in terms of meeting with the parliamentarians. So what we did in our own, time, in our own case was to set up what we call Enugu West People's Parliament. So people from Enugu West will testify to this. So every quarter will gather our constituents, we meet in one of these parliaments, we brief them what we are doing, they ask their questions, tell us their expectations. Let's, 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 come, let's come back to you for in, in, in a minute. Let's speak with our studio audience. Have you at any point tried to reach out to your lawmaker and you've met some form of difficulty or another? Um, please state your name and your constituents, your constituency rather, and make your contribution. Please remember to keep it brief. No. Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Augustine Kunyachana. Okay. I'm from uh, Enugu West. I represent uh, the disability community here in this garden. I've not personally made uh, any communication to my senator or the honorable member in the Federal House of Reps. But I'm, I want to ask this question because of, uh, I may not have this opportunity again. At the national level, the national, the senators and the honorable members has really done well for us persons with disability by passing the law that guarantees our rights, that uh, protects our interests by passing that prohibition act against persons with disability in Nigeria. But I want to state here, I stand to be corrected, 
that apart from Anambra State, that their same law, Anambra State has domesticated that law at their state level and are implementing it almost more than 60%. Okay. But in other states of the Southeast, Enugu State, Abia State, Okay. Emo State and the Boy State. We're, we're going to we're, we're going to take all so of those. I want to know. They, I, no, they I, have I'm done sorry. their own part. I want I, to see I, what I'm they sorry. can do. Are, I, I understand you. I understand you. Okay, but you know, you. just so that we can have continuity here in the studio, we're here and we'll take all of them. But okay. at this point, I'd like for us to speak on access to your lawmakers. So if you would, if you want to speak on anything else, we'd we'll give you room to talk about that. If you want to speak on access to your lawmakers. Uh, then this would be the right time to do it. Uh, we, we want to hear what your experience is when trying to reach out to uh, your lawmakers representing you at the National Assembly. If you think that there are other channels of communication that they should consider opening so that it's easy for you to reach out to them. Remember to tell us your name, what your constituency is, and keep your submission as brief as possible. My name is uh, Ajolo Chuku Edechene. I'm from Sido uh, in the West. And, Can you speak uh, up a little louder, please? Okay. My name is Ajolo Chuku Edechene. I'm from Sudi Oceanuku, in the West Nigeria constituents. And um, I'm, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing about the Enugu West Parliament. I don't know how that is communicated uh, to your constituents. Uh, but personally, from 2015, I've written to your office. I think that was the first time I wrote to your office. I never got the response. And that was um, based on the coal miners uh, issue then that I was involved with. Uh, I've written to you, I think, uh, close to three times. I never got the response. And then uh, during the NSAS campaign, when uh, uh, we asked people to communicate with their uh, representative, uh, your number, I think it uh, has, uh, I think, 0902 or 0802 or so. I, I, I sent a message. I called you. I reached you out on, on Twitter. You never responded. And this, been, this is like from 2.15 till now. I've never gotten a response from my senator. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, please, uh, Senator. First of all, I don't have any of those such numbers. I don't have any phone number, 0802 or 0902. My numbers are 070 340 3888. The other was 080 75 I have no number whatsoever. I never had a number with 082 or 092. So, apparently, we are sending to the wrong number. So, I'm not sure I received any data from you. And I'm sure half of the people here are from Enugu West. They will testify to the efficacy of the Enugu West People's Parliament. There's no place it's done anywhere in the world. They started it. Is that one of our contributions to political science? They are here. So what, what, what then do you think maybe your office could be doing better with allowing access to it? I believe I have this, the easiest access by anybody. If I'm in Enugu, my doors are open. You can go, I'm in Enugu now, so if you come here in the afternoon, you see the number of people at my gate oh, okay. or in my house. If you go to my village, it's something. In Abuja, it's something to my office. Okay. I'm easily assess accessible, so that's not a problem. All right, so I would like to uh, speak to you now, Senator Oba, because, you know, we had one of our constituents here speak on domesticating the law for persons living with disability. And I want to find out what the... I, and I think he was saying that, you know, one state has sort of domesticated it, but another hasn't. So I want yeah. to find out what role the National Assembly plays in encouraging the domestication of laws that they pass. Thank you very much. Incidentally, that bill is my bill. So it was my bill, and I followed it up with all the people of uh, disability until my colleagues in the Senate passed it into law. And when the commission was formed, they first of all sent it to my committee. But later, the executive, the, I didn't know what happened. The president of the Senate removed it from my committee and send it to um, humanitarian ministry. So then the issue of um, 
you know, getting the executive to do is only if we appeal to them. And uh, the governors, um, you can appeal to them. They are the liberty to accept or not accept. I don't think the, the legislator has any right forcing any executive to you know, implement it or not to implement it. You know, the, the, those who have been in the National Assembly older than me, if there's any way, anything they know about that, they can say it. But for me, I don't even my own governor that I used to have, I don't have anyone now. Okay. Well, if you... <laughs> let's talk, let, 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 let me come to Senator Kunife for a minute. Um, okay. What role do you think the National Assembly plays in getting State House of Assemblies to domesticate laws passed at national level? My ours is to just persuade them, is to urge them. We're not going to force them because that is actually in a concurrent list. Uh, is to get the speak to the speakers. They have speakers forum to see the need for them to domesticate that in their respective state assembly. And it, it boils down to what we talk about our governors, the incumbrance of uh, governors on the state legislature and local government and all of that. Uh, most times, the state assembly members would like to do that, but they will look at the, 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 the mindset of their governors. And if the governors don't want, want certain things to be done, most state assemblies will not do that. So it's just to persuade them to let them see the need for them to domesticate that as quickly as possible, because that is one of the landmark uh, uh, bills we've actually passed in this uh, ninth Senate, and it's yes. worth being domesticated. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's important to state here that this, the signing of this uh, bill into law by the president was also partly triggered by one of our town hall meetings uh, called The Candidates, uh, which is also a production of Daria Media. Um, just, you know, thought to put that out there. Um, Senator Baribe, I would also like to get your thoughts on this, uh, because now it, se it, it, it seems as though you would need some sort of influence on State House of Assemblies and maybe governors to get them to domesticate bills that you pass at the national level. How does that work in your opinion? Well, I, I think that what you're saying is uh, exactly what we need to do. Whatever influence we have, we use it to persuade the members of the House of Assembly in each state. It's not just the Disabilities Bill, the Child Rights Act. When, when you also, say influence, is it on an official capacity or on a, on a personal level? It's on a personal level because on the official capacity, once a bill is passed that is supposed to be domesticated, it's normally sent to all the state houses of assembly and they are, um, we normally communicate officially to them to say, we are past this, you need to domesticate it. And like I said, it's not just the disabilities, be the Child Rights Act and so many other acts, the Labor Act and so forth, are supposed to be domesticated in each state. But when the states have their own priorities, there's nothing much you can do about it. And, and what we do most of the time is that when we meet the speakers, the leaders in the house and so forth, we just talk to them quietly to say, this is on your table, why don't you do something about it? But we're not members Do, of Does it frustrate you? Well, of course, we don't feel very happy about it, but there's nothing much we can do. Okay, so let's come back to the audience again. If you would love to speak on accessing your lawmakers, again, because remember, that's the segment of the program that we're in right now, accessing your lawmakers and, you know, if it is at all easy or difficult to reach them whenever you need to reach them, uh, we have a, a hand up here in front, so uh, please let's give the gentleman a microphone to speak. Remember to give us your name, your constituency, and um, make your submission. My name is Sir Ima Oha. I'm from Enugu West. Um, my senator, I think, is the most accessible uh, senator we have in the southeast. I don't think I so. Don't, I don't know for <laughs> that area. <laughs> well, I think well, 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 in it's, Enugu it's West, important yeah, to always so. add that it's your opinion. Well, well in my own <laughs> constituency, uh -huh. I wonder how he operates because... Uh, there was a time I sent him a message about 1, 1, uh, 1.05 a.m. By 1.15, I got a reply. So how, how, how close is your personal relationship with your senator? 
Yeah, he's, he, he attends to everybody, no matter who he is. I send messages to him, and I wonder how he operates, because if you come by 6 in the morning or 7, he's already uh, woken up and uh, very active, and I wonder whether he sleeps. <laughs> so I think he's a very active senator. The number somebody called, 090, has never been his number. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, Th number, thank you very much. There's someone, there's someone else uh, um, at the other end of the room. Okay, let's, let's take one here, and then we'll, call, we'll go to the other side of the room. Uh, please pass the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, my name is um, Hilary Onna. I'm from um, Udenu, local government. And uh, my question, I want to have, ask a question, uh, because uh, I, th I think I stood that I understand that uh, this uh, constituency allowance is not giving cash. You know, uh, I thought before now that is, the money is being given cash. So my question now is, because it seems as if um, the senators we have here is the performing senators. Because from my own zone, I wonder why, if this constituency allowance is, is given to all the senators, why some of the senators are not you know, judiciously using the allowances for the development of their constituents. So my question is, is there any lobby, is there any way the senators lobby before this uh, constituency allowances is being given to them? Thank okay. you so very much. All right, thank you very much. We'll come to that side of the room in just a moment, but Sen Senator, if you would love to um, address that. It's just that we don't have uh, enough time. I would, I would have loved to give you the background relating to all this issue of a uh, constituency project, but I think the major problem we have here is the issue of misconception and what I call a expectation gap. Misconception in the first sense that people have always believed, and they have this mindset that will give monies to national assembly members or state assembly. That never happened before, and it will never happen, you know, because uh, we all have our own responsibilities. So what did it usually happen, as my colleagues have said, is that figures are given to individual parliamentarians. All you need to do is to suggest projects up to that tune. Then the implementing agencies will now advertise it. They will do the procurement and their work. But after that, we we'll keep hearing, oh, they gave you one billion naira to go and okay, do so you know what? Maybe just for the, never did that. Maybe for the purpose of clarity yes. and, you know, because this is partly education now. Um, can you talk us through the, pro okay, the process of, you Very know, quickly. A, of you know, when, deciding on the constitutional yeah, yeah, project when, and when its When democracy returned in 1999, so those who were elected at the time got into the National Assembly. And so it, their constituents never knew the difference between the parliamentarian and the executive. So they kept putting pressure on them. So their response was, to, okay, let's start putting monies into the budget. And then, of course, a person would never allow any such thing. So even if you put one billion on one night, he would never implement it. Then fight started. So they were having these issues until uh, in 2007, when we came into the leadership of the National Assembly. So we had a conversation with the then president, Yaradua, and we agreed on a total sum of 100 billion that can be, uh, they will consider constituent projects for the National Assembly. How do we divide it? What usually happens is that the 40 billion is usually uh, uh, being managed by the leadership okay. of the National Assembly. They'll be able to intervene in sectors that feel very essential, like the electricity, water supply, and then maybe roads. Okay. The remaining 60, each, each uh, geopolitical zone, gets 10 billion. I, I, I mentored that process, that I knew what I'm talking about. So when you come to the states, like South is where we have five states, so we all get 2, 2, 2 billion per state. Now, each state will now break it down to the senators and house members. So you will now get about 200 to 250. This money has nothing to do with you. So you suggest projects up to that amount, and then the implementing agencies. And then you send to them to implement, they'll advertise. Now, because of the amount involved, sometimes you have about 100 communities. And then you want to do roads, you want to do water, you want to do electricity. That can never happen. So if what you need to do is do, to the extent that amount can give you. So then people start complaining that, oh, no, that uh, you're not doing anything for them, but, or that it was just the one kilometer and all of that. Okay. But it's all limited to what you've got. But the tragedy here is that even at that, people keep saying they gave you one million or two million of 250, you chopped the money, you know. <laughs> so meanwhile, nobody gave you anything. In fact, in my own case, there was some time they said they gave me money to do a new good on the share road, and I chopped the money. <laughs> but the guy, someone was telling me this from this guy who lives in America. I said, you do such things in America, you know. There's a real petition to EFCC that gave me the money to go and develop South East and use to buy properties. Okay. Such a sure. ridiculous thing. You know, so I think this kind of event helps us to explain 
the constant so general public yes. you know this misconception and this go to, gap i'd like for us to go to Owerri briefly and take some contributions from Owerri um if you're in standby in Owerri let's uh, let's get your what let's get your contribution remember to give us your name your constituency and then as briefly as possible make your submission um Let's come back to you now, uh, Senator Ikunife. I understand that, you know, you, you don't... Thank you very much. much. My name is... Okay, we're, we're, we do have some, some feedback from Inugu. We'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that shortly. I am from Imo City. And uh, my senator zone is Imo, Imo East. I am the State Secretary of Imo State Market and Traders Association. Going back to accessibility to the senators, most of us don't even know where they have their constituency office. Most of times, when you inquire of them, they will tell you they are in Abuja. Eventually, when they are passing on the road, they are going with heavy security. Incidentally, when they call constituency uh, meetings, they call only their party members. How do we now assess this people? We don't even consider get to them when we have issues. Okay, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, Senator Kunife, if you would love to address that, and thankfully, you know, he's uh, sort of brought the conversation to where okay. I wanted um, to lead us this, to earlier on. Um, we will get to... Stay from away, he must stay. All right, can you hold on? Can you hold on a second? Can you hold on a second in a way? We'll get to you briefly, I apologize. We'll get to you briefly. Um, Senator Kunife, please uh, quickly, you know, address that. How do you decide um, what projects to undertake? Do you call for a town hall meeting? If you do, how often do you do that? Uh, we usually have um, zonal um, interaction, zonal stakeholders briefing. And in that briefing, of course, uh, you have representatives of each town, President General, the traditional rulers, the market leaders, the religious body and all of that. And people will come with their suggestions, their inputs and suggestions, and um, also their requirements and the things they want their legislator to do. And when you do, after that, you have to go into what you call a um, collation yeah. of all the, all the demands and requirements. And you put them in perspectives okay. to know uh, the priority areas. Okay. And for me, when I look at all the demands, I look at the priority areas vis-a-vis -vis right. what I have done in those communities before, then articulate them, put them in compartments and be able to see how I can allocate the 250 million naira allocated to, to my zone. zone yes. and so I always have my zone briefing. Right. In fact, the one for this uh, uh, First quarter will be coming on 20th of April. So I do okay. that four times in a year okay. for me to have let, a... Let, let me talk to say briefly to you, Senator, but there's also, like you've heard, the accusation that when you come for town halls that uh, you limit these interactions to party members. How, how, would you, how would you respond to that? Maybe that happens only in Imo State. His constituents. <laughs> you can't generalize it because uh, nobody can say that in my... Uh, constraints. It is very, very important. And, uh, but initially, let me say this. It's not easy, even easy to convey this uh, town hall meeting. We thank God now, you know, because when I started initially, it took me time. My government, when you call the meeting, they thought you are looking for their seats. And they will tell you, why are you calling this meeting? That's a town hall meeting. Town hall meeting. Okay. It's as bad as that. You know, but today we have to fight and fight and fight and get over it. When you now don't... Okay. Yeah. All right. Now we're calling meetings, and when we call meetings, both people in other political parties. Okay. Because the moment you win election, it's no longer party issue. All right. It's then. not for everybody. Okay. And uh, my constituents, if you say not, they will tell you, both in my house in the village, I don't, my okay. gate is not closed. All right, then. It's thank always you. open. Th th thank you very much. Um, we will have more of your contributions in just a moment, but um, I also want to say thank you very much to uh, Senator Ikunife for honoring our invitation to come here today. And also thank you to Senator Obina Oba for in, uh, honoring our invitation today. Stay with us. We still have more lawmakers. We'll still take more of your submissions. Remember, this is Open Square, reaching you live wherever you are in the world from Inugu, alongside Southeastern lawmakers. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Open Square, reaching you live wherever you are in the world from the cold city of Enugu. I am Chika Agu, and today we're joined by lawmakers from the Southeast. And just moments ago, we were joined by Honorable Toby Okechuko, who is the representative for Aniri Agu Oji River Federal Constituency at the House of Representatives. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, sir. Uh, we appreciate you taking our time to engage with us today. Thanks for having me. And so let's get back to the conversation that we are having here in the studio. I remember that if you would like to join this conversation from wherever you are at home, all you have to do is text the WhatsApp number on your screen right now and we will take your contributions here in the studio. And because this is a starting point uh, for you, Honorable uh, Representative Ekechuku, I would like to give you the chance to speak on what you think your job as a representative at the House of Rep is. Do you think it's different in any way from that of uh, a senator at the Senate? Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Well, the job of a legislator comes within the realm of the responsibility of government to provide order and good governance, welfare and security for the citizens. It is within the, that range that you also legislate. It is also to ensure good governance that you oversight. So there is no dramatic difference except that there are certain responsibilities that senators shoulder, like confirmation of ministers. Uh, we do not do that. There are also uh, issues of uh, the, 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 the concurrence. When they pass laws in the Senate, we merely have to concur. Unless there is a, a, a corresponding bill that would require us going to public hearing, we do that. It is the same with reserves the Senate. There is no dramatic difference uh, in our responsibilities except in the area I've mentioned. All right. So let's keep it moving now. Um, I want to ask you, um, Senator Kore Madu, you know, let's begin from you again. When carrying out your duties at the National Assembly, what comes first? National interest or the interest of your senatorial district? First of all, you know, we are described as senators of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So we look at the entire country as our constituency. So whatever is happening in Burundi also is of uh, importance to me as much as what is happening in uh, Uti. So we see ourselves as um, senators of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, as I said. But remember, there are some people hired us, and these are our constituents, constituents. So you need to also put that in proper perspective, because for you to return to the assembly, you need to ensure that uh, you take seriously the matter that concern them. So you have to find a balance. You know, but most times they don't conflict national interest and um, the interest of my constituents. But are there rare cases when they conflict? Well, if they do conflict, definitely uh, you have to um, side the people who you are representing. But without them, it won't be where you are, right? So because if you now say you want um, to do, um, say, rail lines, and then you are doing rail line from Lagos to uh, Kano, which is of national interest anyway, because that's a good corridor. But you are not seeing anything happening in the uh, Eastern Corridor between Port Harcourt and Medugri. There's a conflict. Naturally, I will speak for my people and I say, look, why not? So if you are spending money for the Western Corridor, you should also spend for the Eastern Corridor. If you don't have money for both of them, you have to wait. You know, so those are some of the rare times to have that kind of issues. So that's why you need equity, we need justice, we need fairness to all concerned for you to have a country that you can uh, uh, say that it's a uh, democratic. Um, Senator Oba, let's come to you. Do you consider vulnerable people in your constituency women, children, people living with disabilities, and what projects do you carry out for their benefits? Well, uh, thank you very much. I, 
as I said earlier, I, I do consult my constituents. I know what they need. In fact, I came here with a magazine, which I'm going to distribute. This is my magazine. And all the projects, both uh, the scholarship, the number of people I've given scholarships, the number of people I have assisted to employ for my constituents, about 100 and something. Their names and phone numbers is here. The, the people I have empowered, both for training, they are here. Both the people are empowered by the use of uh, vehicles, uh, call it motorcycles and what have you. It's all here with their names and phone numbers. So, and I have, I came with uh, some numbers of this okay. booklet. So, as, at the end of it, I'm going to dispute it. Okay. You can make phone calls, you know, to consult, all you right. know, to find so, out. So. Um, um, let's, let's come to you now, Honorable Kechuku. My question is, when you put out projects, when you put out legislative projects in your community, how do you get feedback on whether these projects are actually serving the needs of the people for which they have been um, implemented in the first place? Much. Uh, actually, I want to bring some, uh, also some further input regarding constituency projects, as well as uh, you see, one of the primary things legislators do, even when it is not within the Constitution, is to peddle influence. And that influence, you peddle them around the ministries and agencies of government to attract things for your people. That is why you can have a job you facilitated that is about 40 billion looking at major road projects. Like the senator was saying, because he was particular about doing a Nugu and nature. And they would have thought that pressurizing for it, going to talk to them to award it, it was, the money was given to him. The old Nugu and nature road, same. So, but what we do as uh, legislators, or what I do particularly, is I interface with my constituents. I have had instances where I would come to, like, let's say, Oji Urban, mm. which is one of my constituencies. I told them that the only way I can do this, uh, I mean, reticulating water around the market, would be for, that, for us to be partners. Mm. If you take care of it very well, then we'll go further and do more. I did that personally, not even projects. But the best way to do it is that you get feedback, either through letters, where okay. there are issues, they get back to you. If it is major, they intervene. you intervene. Mm -hmm. If it is not, the expectation is that there should be community participation. Mm -hmm. But there have been instances where you have borehole tabs, you know, uh, they, they get bad, you start getting calls, you know, from constituents. But most of the time, we encourage them to participate and ensure that, well, it is good to do projects. Maintenance will be that of the communities. And where there is healthy relationship with local governments, you also expect them to intervene in some okay. of these issues. All right. Thank you very much. We have a question from, um, one, of our, from, from one of our participants, but, you know, participating from their home. And this, I guess, would be to you, Senator Kuramadu. They're asking what exactly the government is doing to address the sufferings of Enugu people as it concerns access to portable water. Well, I'm not um, a state legislator anyway, mm. and I'm not a functionary of the state government, but I'm aware that the government of Enugu state is uh, addressing the issue. I think they, um, they applied for a loan, about 50 uh, million euros and then they've been trying to do the procurement and then they had issues with the um, COVID but they were supposed to um, import some of the components you know so this has been a major constraint for them and uh, they're also trying to rehabilitate the existing lines you know which some of them had uh, 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 been outdated and uh, rusted so I believe the government of a new state will be in a better position okay. than but I know that the governor is doing something about it. All right. Let's talk to, I, I would like to talk, talk to women in the audience right now, particularly. 
um, when it comes to constituency projects, um, how do you think of or how would you describe the way in which lawmakers address your needs as women, um, as people living with disability? I understand that, you know, we have a representative of, uh, of a group of persons living with disability in the audience. How do you, how, how would you describe, you know, some of the projects that have been carried out to help change things that affect you in your community? Because remember, the question now is, if they consider women, children, and vulnerable people in the community when carrying out projects. So if there are women here who would love to ask questions or make submissions in terms of projects and whether they affect them positively or not, uh, please raise up your hand and the person with the mic will walk across to you and um, hand the mic over to you. If there's also anybody living with disability here who would love to speak on this, uh, please raise up your hand and we would reach you. Uh, there is, uh, we, we have someone at the other end of the room there. Um, also in Oweri, you're on standby as well. I'm speaking to the women in the audience particularly now. Um, how do you describe the work that is done in terms of projects and if indeed they have any uh, impacts on your life as a woman? Let's hear your contribution now, please. Thank you once again. I, on behalf of persons with disability, I want to submit here that uh, when projects are being implemented uh, for the community, for the society, most of the time uh, there are specific uh, conditions and needs that should be in fix, should be fixed to such uh, projects. Let me give example i've uh, protested against i've complained about this the, in any state for instance uh, there was there was the time they renovated most of uh, the the bus stops and uh, in their renovation they neglected that a person with on wheelchair can use that uh, bus stop and uh, there's no you know, there's no form of ramp there are some, some of the bus stops that are placed behind uh, uh, gutters that no person with physical disability, no person with a, on which year can use that place. And the essence of having bus stops are uh, that when there's rain, somebody can enter there. So I want to know, is there any way the legislators can do something in, that, in this area? That's a, they say, a saying that goes that nothing about us without us. In as much as a, at the governance level, persons with disability are not there. So how do you factor in these special needs that should be in all the projects? We're not talking of the specific projects that concerns only persons with disability. We're talking of general projects that everybody will benefit from. How okay. do you put in those specific areas that we protect and they provide for persons with right. disability? All yeah. right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a submission on stamp, a submission in Oweri waiting. So let's take that contribution and then I will take more from the room here if we have any. Let's go to Oweri now. I am Ezra Nachi Yerebe Njelabo from my husband, Big Coming to the constituency project, our senators, our House of Representatives, even to the House of Assembly, they don't carry the women along. Where they are carrying their projects, we don't know. So we are pleading to them. Okay, we are telling them that they carry the women along in their constituency projects. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, any other submissions here in the room? Um, women who are concerned that projects may not necessarily be tailored towards them. Um, let, let's take one from uh, the lady at the back, please. Okay. And please remember to give us your name and where you're from. Listening. Okay, so. Good morning, honorable senators. And my name is Oni Mama. I also support what the lady behind the scenes said. Because something has been running on recently in Nigeria, and 
I'm part of the pioneers. I've been trying so much to reach our honorable senators and our House of Rep members. I've called them. I've sent tests right up till now. I've just gotten response yes, from sir. Honorable Chimaroke Namani and Honorable Cornelius Naji. The rest have not returned our calls. Even when I was explicit to say that the responses I'm sending to you is on pushing the gender bills of which the whole 36 states are on. And currently, Enugu is so poor with our assessment and our follow-up. And I've tried to reach out to all the senators and all the national rep members. None of them, just Senator Chimaroki and Toby Okech, who have gone as far as going to their constituency office. And some I went to their house to drop the letters. Up till now, I've not get, gotten a response. And when I hear women say, we're not being carried along, I just came up to support it. Because what would the electorate benefit from the elected who now make themselves inaccessible for, especially women, considering that we have the critical mass, we are the most vulnerable, and we have things we are supposed to send to them which they are interceding on our behalf. How can they best intercede for us if they don't hear from us, if they are far from us? Okay. Also, at some point, we just come out, and very soon in 2023, the number of people you will see in all the election wards will be higher in women. So if you don't give the women the space, if you don't listen to us, if you don't hear us, why would you say you're interceding for us? When we don't share a relationship for, with you, even if it's from afar, we mustn't get to them directly. Okay. But they are supposed to have intermediaries we can reach. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, we've heard them, Senator Oba will take one, and um, Honorable Kechuku will take one. But we also do have Representative Henry Mwamba for Mbitoli Ikeduru Federal Constituency in most state joining us right now via Zoom. Thank you very much for joining the conversation uh, today, Representative Mwamba. We'll come to you in just a moment. Uh, let's quickly get responses to some of the issues raised in the room right now. Senator. Well, the problem of Nigeria in every sector is amorphous. So you just do the best you can in the circumstance. In my area, which I believe uh, is something all over the country, when women get married early, they don't have the uh, access to education. So now they are struggling to be part of the society. So what we've done in this circumstance is to lay the proper foundation to enable them to be part and parcel of the era we find ourselves, the digital era. So what we did was to set up uh, adult mass literacy centers. So we teach them how to read and write. And then from there, we hire teachers, provide all the material, and then they get graduated from the primary school sometimes to secondary school. Today, most of them can read and write. And the best you can do for any woman, indeed any person, okay. to provide education. Then, of course, we also arrange a microcredit for them, organize seminars for them, and teach them, give them skills. You know, so I don't believe in giving people handouts. All right, all right. So teach them how to survive. And best thing you can do for those people is education. All right. Um, let's, let me come to you now, Senator. But one of the issues raised here in the hall is that of pushing the gender bills. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the gender bills that have been submitted at the National Assembly, uh, some, of that, some of them that you know, we did not even get to see past. And if you think that was at all a missed opportunity at helping uh, women in our country today. Thank you very much. For me, I think um, uh, the women, I, I voted for them in the two of the, of the bill. I voted for them. But you know, the thing has to do with numbers. And um, I think there's one of the bills that they made a mistake. When they say, I, when they are say, I think they are trying to say 10%. But what was written in that bill was um, 10 commissioners or 10 ministers. And uh, so many of us are now saying, what of a state that is small that have only maybe 12 or 13 commissioners? And if you have 10 women as commissioners, what happened? So I think maybe it's a mistake they made, and if it's corrected, it, it, I will also support it. But the other two bills, they are 35% and others. I voted for it. But you know, the people from the other side, 
Many of them don't even believe their wife will come out, not to talk of, you know. So they will tell you openly, they will not, they will not support this. And what do we do? And you know, we, the PDP, we are in minority, yeah, as far as the, 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 the Senate is concerned. So our own number cannot, you know, make the, the number that is required. So to me, but to me, in my constituents, I carry women, you know, along because without them, we can't we can be happy, you know? So, um, and, and to you, um, Honorable Okechuku, you see, this gender bill is one that a lot of, that, that, that got a lot of negative reaction from women across the country. And I do know that, uh, the, that, that there's, there are conversations on revisiting uh, some of these bills again. And I wonder, you know, if we can have any sort of expectations as to where these bills will go. Yeah, thank you very much. First and foremost, you talked about uh, this uh, disability, you know, accommodating them in our constituents. I just mentioned it. Inherent in that Disability Act. Okay is a requirement okay. for I, regulation. I'm, we would come back to you and you would finish that in just a moment, but we would go on a short break right now. And when we return, we'll continue with comments from Honorable Okechukwu and then take more from Honorable Mwamba. We're reaching you live from Enugu, the coast city. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're listening, you're watching Open Square live from Enugu, the coal city. I am Chika Agu, here with lawmakers representing constituents from the southeast. And just moments ago, um, Honorable Okechuko, you were telling us about what you do or what you think of the gender bills and what Nigerians can expect when that bill is revisited again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, regarding the gender bills, I was one of those responsible after the, uh, the bills were uh, rejected by the House of Representatives. I was one of those, and I seconded the motion that it should, we should reverse ourselves in response to the yearnings of Nigerians. And uh, I'm sure that in the next constitutional review, that will come up. Uh, for, for us to address them. What is there is that sometimes the records of voting may not show where you, we have voted. Um, we will show where we have voted. So it is for purposes of advocacy that, look, you don't preach to the converted. What we need is to preach to those who are still reluctant to support uh, these bills. But it does no injury to anybody that our women are further and better accommodated into the public space and public service. And I was also going to say that, well, we carry our women along in terms of things we do. We do trainings that are particularly tailored to them in terms of uh, training with regard to catering, training with regard to education. We make sure there is some balance between the male child and the female child when we will intervene personally for purposes of uh, education. But more importantly is the fact that projects we do have general application. Mm. If you do roads, women, men would walk uh, or use them. If you do water, it's going to be fetched by everybody. Okay. But we, out of our own okay. consideration and passion for women, we go out to make sure that we have projects that are particularly to work to lot towards them. Okay. And the last point is the one you mentioned about uh, uh, disability, where, where you asked yes. how do we come Inherent in the legislation is the reason why those laws were made, to make things better for them. And it is now a matter of advocacy, and it is now a matter of uh, regulation. Like if you come to Enugu, you have a capital territory that approves drawings. Mm. You come to Koren and they should make standards. But you know, I think that when it comes to people living with disability, sometimes what works for everybody doesn't necessarily work for them if we are not deliberate about making it work for them. So in designing these projects, 
what amount of consciousness goes into making sure that even if it works for able-bodied people, it must work for people That's with disabilities as well. That's where I'm going to, because inherent in the regulation is that when you mm. seek for approval of these drawings, if it is not con if, if those provisions or is not designed to accommodate them, it will automatically be rejected. Mm. That's how it happens. Even in hospitals, in schools, once it is not part and parcel of the design, you're not get the, going to get the approval. Okay. And it is a condition precedent for you to approve. So those, it is a matter of advocacy, both okay. by the legislator and civil society. All right. So we do have more contributions on standby in Oweri. Uh, let's go to our remote location now in Oweri and take one more contribution. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, the work that your lawmakers do in terms of inclusivity for women, children, and people living with disabilities? Do you think that more can be done, and in what areas do you think that this progress can be, or, or these changes can be implemented? Let's hear you. Remember to give us your name and um, your constituency. Okay, thank you very much again. My name is um, Apostle Clinton Chinoyere Mamechi. Um, I have some easily in the federal constituency or where is senatorial district. And uh, I want to say that in this issue of um, constituency projects, the most hit remain persons with disabilities. I want to say if truly we are being carried along, there are a number of aids that government approved for those representatives. And if you go, they pick able bodied men and women. No one disabled person is represented in that appointment. And they, um, that makes me say, we are not carried along, we are not included. And if we are not there, they are sharing anything like the project uh, uh, initiative they are talking about you see that nobody will speak for us. Nobody will fight for us. Everybody would want his house first. Okay. So okay. we are not carried along. Okay. I am asking that if there is anything that can be done from the angle of the National, National Assembly to ensure that every constituency can carry persons living with disabilities along effectively, openly, to the best knowledge of Nigerians. Okay. They, they should do it from there. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is going to be one for Representative Henry Mwawoba to take. The, the question here is, um, do, you, do you consider disabled people when making decisions on maybe bringing in your personal aids or even carrying out projects in your community and if you do can you talk to us about some of these projects that are specifically target, targeted at you know addressing the needs of people living with disability women and children well thank you thank you very much uh let me just say it's a delight to join you again um, I'm having a bit of a challenge with the audio, but if I got you correctly, you're asking my inclusiveness with regards to what I do in my constituency concerning disabled uh, people living with disability and women. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, let me just start by saying that I do believe that um, we do have a lot of gaps in including people living with disabilities generally as a country. I understand that they have special needs. Um, it's sometimes difficult to distill at the level that we're working uh, in parliament. Um, if you have uh, 400,000 constituents and everybody is before you uh, at the same time, except you take conscious effort 
to, to bring stuff that you target to women and people living with disabilities, you might miss them. So um, I do have a regular engagements with them. Um, unfortunately, most times their request is always they need the bus or they need wheelchairs. And I really think that we need to go beyond uh, providing buses and wheelchairs for people living with disability and engage them in productive manners if we do deployments in terms of um, cottage industries. Um, there's nothing stopping uh, people living with disabilities, uh, depending on what type of disability they have, from participating. Um, personally, I have done um, oil mills, fish farms, and they're open. Uh, I do have one or two people that are, are living with disabilities in wheelchair, even in my own personal staff in my house. Uh, and so, I, what I would like to see, or to, how I would like this question to be framed, is what is our national conscious effort to make laws that would target inclusiveness, uh, make every MDA an equal opportunity employer, um, see how we can increase the numbers of um, laws that make life easier for people living with disabilities. Uh, in the Eighth Assembly, we did make laws that would make wheelchair accessibility a mandate in every public building. Um, but if you, if you ask every lawmaker uh, one by one what they're doing uh, for people living with disabilities, I'm afraid uh, we're going to be constrained to give you responses that are within the, our constitution precludes us from discrimination against uh, anyone based on age, uh, religion, sex, or disability. Uh, and so uh, I know that you will not be seeing the, the uh, how there's room to do a bit more. Uh, I, I always use the opportunity of uh, January 1st to have a breakfast meeting with people living with disability in my constituency. I have two local governments, Mbitolu and Ikedulu. And I always use that to galvanize them and aggregate their collective opinions to know what they request from, from the national board, from my office. And obviously, like I said, most times they're unable to place requests beyond buses and wheelchairs. Right. Uh, but they're all included in every empowerment program, every training, every uh, opportunity for you know, working in the, I just finished building an abattoir in my local government to sanitize the meat ecosystem and um, making that able to participate in that, uh, you know, in, in that uh, facility uh, engaged. I don't know if that uh, uh, speaks to the question that he asked. Okay. All right. Well, th thank you very much. And uh, we will continue to take more submissions from the audience if there are any. Um, if you would like to uh, make any contribution, raise your hand and we will pass the microphone to you um, in just a moment. But uh, quickly moving on, I want you to, uh, I, I want to now ask, because, you know, at the start, um, we did say that one thing that we're also going to touch on at this program is the challenges that you face on the job. And so, uh, beginning with you again, Senator Kuramadu, what are some of the challenges that you see on the job every day? And how does this impact the work that you do serving your constituents? Well, first of all, um, we have to tie it to our responsibilities. We've spoken about the issue of oversight. The oversight means they are calling the executive to account. And so when you take that route, sometimes they'll see that you're confronting the government. You know, but they're just asking harmless questions and trying to ensure that the correct things are done. And then the government to misunderstand you completely. You know, so that's why sometimes we invite ministers and heads of parastatals to appear before a committee, and then they find the schools not to come. And sometimes they take the matter up to the president, and then the secretary of the government, and someone begins to interfere. And they say, oh, well, you're inviting them so much. So that has been frustrating the issue of uh, oversight. The other one is this, is what I said earlier, what I consider the, the uh, gap in expectations. So people expect so much from the parliamentarians when, in the first place, they're not in position to do that. 
you know, so they have just um, access to limited resources. How, how, how do you think we can bridge the gap in, in knowledge or in expectation? Well, this kind of conversation is very important. We need to engage our constituents to know the limits or the powers of the members of the parliament, you know, so that they'll be able to know what they're expecting from them and also engage them constructively to ensure that they perform those responsibilities. It's very, very key because if you don't have the uh, knowledge of what their, their, their parliamentarians are supposed to do, sometimes you take them outside their responsibilities and uh, expect them to be doing the work of both the judiciary yeah. and uh, the executive, which is not going to work. So, but I think that proper education and uh, conversation needs to be carried out from time to time, you know, but I think this kind of conversation is key to this kind of understanding. process in which you, or the mechanism that's put in place to ensure that your people can tell you when they are not satisfied with the work that you're doing, representing them at the, um, at the National Assembly. Do you have any of such mechanisms in place? Excuse me. There are, there are so many ways they can tell you. They, they, use, they, they can tell you on sending text to you telling you what they expect from you that you're not doing, if there's any. And uh, when you call for a town hall meeting, somebody, just as people are raising their hand now, somebody can raise their hand and make some observations. Mm. So they can also write you a letter telling you. There are so many ways. There's no particular lay down. And are, the the people, are your people aware of your challenges on the job when you want when you you know, try to carry out your functions? Yeah, some of them are aware, but majority don't know. In fact, the, the problem, the major problem we're facing is that majority of them thought, as I said earlier, that when you go to National Assembly, there's a pool that you go and get money because everybody in the hospital, in the constituents, in their constituents must get money from you to be able to pay for hospital bill. If anybody, students, the same thing. Not minding that you have about 50 people you are paying for your scholarship, you know, every year. But anybody who has no money to pay for his or her school fees, reach you, you must bring. And when you say there's no money, you are not representing them very well. Mm. These are the major problems mm -hmm. we have. But right. you continue to explain to them, you continue to tell them, you continue to interact with them for them okay. to understand that there's no, you can't go beyond what you can, because it's only what you have that you can give out. All right, and um, let's come to the audience now. Let's pass the mic to someone in the audience and get a uh, contribution, your thoughts on uh, whatever you would love to raise. Um, is there a microphone? Let's pass to the gentleman here in front. Um, can, can we get a microphone and pass to the gentleman here in front, please? Or whoever is with the mic can just uh, whoever is with the mic can just speak up. So while we wait on the microphones to be while we wait on the microphones to uh, to get to him, this is also also a very important question that I'd love for us to address right now. And um, let me begin with you, Honourable uh, Okay Chuko. Do you think that the National Assembly, as currently constituted, serves the Southeast very well? And if not, how can we begin to effect changes to address that? Well, thank you very much. Um, ordinarily, you will expect a national parliament to address evenly the challenges of development, the challenges of injustice, the challenges of uh, you know, what problems come to any part of the country. This is so because there isn't any part of the country that suffers injustice that will be interested in peace. Yes. And when anything is happening in Borono or Southeast and they think it doesn't concern you, it will eventually snowball. So the expectation is that it should serve well. But you know, some of the activities, you know, of what happens in government is first and foremost initiated from uh, the executive. And like the, uh, the senator, the, my senator initially pointed out, why should rail be going on in the Western Corridor from Lagos to Kano, and it's not going on 
in the Eastern Corridor from Port Harcourt to, and those rails were established the same day. So when, in terms of uh, government proposal, it is not addressed, when we resist it, it's not because we don't want it to happen in other places. It's just because it's not been addressed. Okay. So the national parliament can intervene as much as the number you have mm -hmm. in that parliament. And okay. presently, it is uh, lopsided. Okay. Um, let's go to Honorable, Wanwuba, Honorable Aaron Wanwuba, uh, who's, joined us via a um, who's joining us from a remote location. And the question really is, do you think that the National Assembly, as currently constituted, serves the needs and interests of the people of the Southeast? And if you do think that it does not, how can we address it? Look, I, I think I'm just going to say it like it is. I absolutely do not think that the National Assembly is inclusive as presently constituted, both uh, in, the, in the House of Reps and in the Senate. Take a look at the leadership of the House, for instance. It, if you were to go by the Charter of Equity or to solve the problems that were foreseen or what our, uh, the framers of our Constitution foresaw and included the Charter of Equity um, um, federal character, the speakership of the House of Representatives should have been in the Southeast right now, even within the ruling party. And then since the, the commencement of this assembly, if you see the struggle that we have had to pass through, both in the 8th and the 9th assembly, to include agenda of the Southeast, if you recall in the 8th assembly, Southeast Development Commission bill, which everybody argued in favor, but when it came to votes, it failed on, on the floor of the House of Representatives, but luckily we were bailed out by the Senate, and so we reintroduced it in the Ninth Assembly and it has gone through okay. the second reading. Ditto for when the federal government was going to uh, uh, take if you can the loan. Quickly, if you can there was absolutely up. no project okay. for the Southeast extraction that was in the, in, 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 the, the, in the application for the loan. And we had to come back and work together in synergy with the Senate and the House to okay. push the Southeast agenda. I mean, I can go on All and right. on well, okay. we, and, we, and we, say- we're, we're, and fast running out of time. Honest, so. We're fast running out of time, Honorable. So let's quickly take one submission here in Oweri, uh, one in Oweri rather, and one here in uh, the studio, please. Uh, remember, in 30 seconds, we'd love for you to uh, say all that you have to say and uh, wrap it up. Um, in Oweri, please stay on standby as well. We'll come to you in just a second. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Doj Kujuku. I'm from Oweri North uh, Senatorial Zone. Um, I think uh, the National Assembly, by design, was not uh, meant to have effective representation. Otherwise, I don't know why my Okay. We'll be living in Abuja. Yes. You know, their campaign offices right. are actually more open and wider than their constituency offices. So you barely see them uh, to even engage. Most of them are giving their numbers as if everybody has a, a phone number. What of those who don't have phone numbers? So automatically okay. they are All eliminated right. from the process All right. thank, of uh, thank you. Thank you. their representative. Thank you very much. Let's beyond, come back. Let's beyond, come back to the sorry. studio now and take our submission here in the studio. Uh, please remember to keep it brief. Okay. Thank you. My name is Engineer Judah Soga. Uh, I was here. I'm from Enugu North Senatorial Zone. So I was waiting to see my own senator and uh, rep members uh, on this road. So I want to beg you next time you try to invite them so that uh, we'll see what the other senators are doing. Like Senator uh, Professor Ike Kuremado. I'm from Enugu North, and he gave me, he gave us borehole and road. So I don't know how he do the magic. So by okay. the time you do this program more and more so that other senators will follow suit. And that is why we from other zone are clamoring for him to come at okay, least to so take would, over the governorship would, of would, Enugu State, come 2023. But I just, want Thank to say, you. I just want to say here that invitations, the invitation for this program was sent to every senator every current seven senator and representative from the five southeastern states. I just want to make that clear here. So if any of your lawmaker isn't here present, you would have to take this up with them. Um, Senator Kuremadu, we're running out of time, so I'd love for us to, as quickly as possible, wrap this up. Do you think that 
the National Assembly, as currently constituted, serves the interest of the people of the Southeast? Well, the number is lopsided because of the way um, the states are created. Because right now, Southeast have just five um, states, when others are seven and six. So with uh, the Senate of uh, three senators per state, we have just 15. Some have 18 and some 21. So when it comes to voting, even in terms of uh, resource distribution, we are shortchanged. Okay. If you go to the House of Reps, similar thing. Okay. You know, so I believe that the fair, fair thing to do is for the country to agree so, for us to have an extra state for the Southeast mm. so that that will enable us to be able to match with the rest of the countries in terms of opportunities at National Assembly. Okay, so um, Senator Oba, real quick, do you support the creation of an extra state from the Southeast and do you think this addresses any issue um, pertaining the Southeast at the national level? I'd love for you to keep this as brief as possible, please. For sure, I'm in full support of it. In fact, it's not, if you look at what is happening at the national level now, we cried and cried at the issue of the security. Uh, one, one person, no single person from the Southeast is a member of the Security Council in this country. If you go to NNPC, they establish, these are the, things, the major, major things that this country owns together. When they come, they remove the Southeast. You can't find anybody. Even in the Eighth Assembly, the EFCC board, and the law will say all the zones must be represented. But when they come, they will skip the Southeast. So, we can't allow it to continue. You so, know, so, to uh, Honorable and that's why we're saying that in the coming election, yes. it should allow the Southeast person to become the so, next president Honorable of Kichuko, the country. Do you have any thoughts on how some of this lopsidedness can be addressed? First and foremost is that the, the policy and the activities of the government in power should change. Whatever they bring up is what follows. The appointments to security chiefs, uh, uh, proposals to the legislature, okay. and then the occupation of the leadership of the House. Okay. These are deliberate steps that a party can take, like the PDP did. They zone them, they spread them to make sure that all parts of the country are accommodated. So most of the divisiveness or challenges we have actually matters of the party in government. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you very much to members of the National Assembly here present. Thank you very much for joining this conversation today and sharing with us uh, your thoughts on how we can continue to deepen democracy in our country today. I thank you very much to Senator Ike Koremadu, uh, who is the senator representing Enugu West Senatorial District, to Senator Uche Kunife for Anambra Central uh, Senatorial District. Thank you very much. Also to Senator Obina Oba for Ebony Central Senatorial District. Thank you very much for joining the conversation today. Uh, senator Eli Naya Baribe, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, to Honorable Tobi Okechuku for Aniri Agu Oji River Federal Constituency, thank you very much. And also to Representative Henry Uwamba from Bitole, Ike Duru Federal Constituency in Imo State. Thank you very much. To members of the civil society here present as well, thank you very much for honoring our invitation. And to everyone who's tuned in to this town hall from anywhere across the world, thank you very much for joining the conversation today. Open Square will take place in other zones in the country, so watch out. It could be your zone we will announce next. And also thank you very much to Channels Television to MacArthur Foundation and Radio Now 95.3 FM Lagos for supporting this program as well. I am Chika Agu, and this is Open Square, reaching you live from the coast city of Enugu. Bye-bye.